Chapter 110. Queequeg in His Coffin. Upon searching, it was found that the casks last struck into the hold were perfectly sound, and that the leak must be further off. So, it being calm weather, they broke out deeper and deeper, disturbing the slumbers of the huge ground-tier butts, and from that black midnight sending those gigantic moles into the daylight above. So deep did they go, and so ancient and corroded and weedy the aspect of the lowermost puncheons, that you almost looked next for some mouldy cornerstone cask containing coins of Captain Noah, with copies of the posted placards vainly warning the infatuated old world from the flood. Tierce after tierce, too, of water and bread and beef and shooks of staves and iron bundles of hoops were hoisted out, till at last the piled decks were hard to get about, and the hollow hull echoed underfoot as if you were treading over empty catacombs, and reeled and rolled in the sea like an air-freighted demijohn. Top-heavy was the ship as a dinnerless student with all Aristotle in his head. Well was it that the typhoons did not visit them then. Now at this time it was that my poor pagan companion and fast-bosom friend Queequeg was seized with a fever, which brought him nigh to his endless end. Be it said that in this vocation of whaling, sinecures are unknown. Dignity and danger go hand in hand. Till you get to be captain, the higher you rise, the harder you toil. So with poor Queequeg, who, as harpooner, must not only face all the rage of the living whale, but, as we have elsewhere seen, mount his dead back in a rolling sea, and finally descend into the gloom of the hold, and, bitterly sweating all day in that subterraneous confinement, resolutely manhandle the clumsiest casks and see to their stowage. To be short, among whalemen, the harpooners are the holders, so called. Poor Queequeg! When the ship was about half disemboweled, you should have stooped over the hatchway and peered down upon him there where, stripped to his woollen drawers, the tattooed savage was crawling about amid that dampness and slime, like a green-spotted lizard at the bottom of a well. And a well or an ice-house it somehow proved to him, poor pagan, where, strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days' suffering, laid him in his hammock, close to the very sill of the door of death how he wasted and wasted away in those few long lingering days, till there seemed but little left of him but his frame and tattooing. But as all else in him thinned and his cheekbones grew sharper, his eyes nevertheless seemed growing fuller and fuller. They became of a strange softness of luster, and mildly but deeply looked out at you there from his sickness, a wondrous testimony to that immortal health in him which could not die or be weakened. And, like circles on the water which, as they grow fainter, expand, so his eyes seemed rounding and rounding like the rings of eternity. An awe that cannot be named would steal over you, as you sat by the side of this waning savage, and saw as strange things in his face as any beheld who were bystanders when Zoroaster died. For whatever is truly wondrous and fearful in man, never yet was put into words or books. And the drawing near of death, which alike levels all, alike impresses all with a last revelation, which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. So that, let us say it again, no dying Chaldee or Greek had higher and holier thoughts than those whose mysterious shades you saw creeping over the face of poor Queequeg, as he quietly lay in his swaying hammock, and the rolling sea seemed gently rocking him to his final rest, and the ocean's invisible flood-tide lifted him higher and higher towards his destined heaven. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and as for Queequeg himself, what he thought of the case was forcibly shown by a curious favour he asked. He called one to him in the grey morning watch when the day was just breaking, and taking his hand said that while in Nantucket he had chanced to see certain little canoes of dark wood, like the rich war-wood of his native isle, 
and upon inquiry he had learned that all whalemen who died in nantucket were laid in those same dark canoes and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him for it was not unlike the custom of his own race who after embalming a dead warrior stretched him out in his canoe and so left him to be floated away to the starry archipelagos for not only do they believe that the stars are isles but that far beyond all visible horizons their own mild uncontinented seas interflow with the blue heavens and so form the white breakers of the milky way he added that he shuddered at the thought of being buried in his hammock according to the usual sea custom tossed like something vile to the death-devouring sharks no he desired a canoe like those of nantucket all the more congenial to him being a whaleman that like a whaleboat these coffin canoes were without a keel though that involved but uncertain steering and much leeway adown the dim ages now when this strange circumstance was made known aft the carpenter was at once commanded to do queequeg's bidding whatever it might include there was some heathenish coffin-coloured old lumber aboard which upon a long previous voyage had been cut from the aboriginal groves of the lackaday islands and from these dark planks the coffin was recommended to be made no sooner was the carpenter apprised of the order than taking his rule he forthwith with all the indifferent promptitude of his character proceeded into the forecastle and took queequeg's measure with great accuracy regularly chalking queequeg's person as he shifted the rule ah poor fellow he'll have to die now ejaculated the long island sailor going to his vice-bench the carpenter for convenience sake and general reference now transferringly measured on it the exact length the coffin was to be and then made the transfer permanent by cutting two notches at its extremities this done he marshalled the planks and his tools and to work when the last nail was driven and the lid duly planed and fitted he lightly shouldered the coffin and went forward with it inquiring whether they were ready for it yet in that direction overhearing the indignant but half-humorous cries with which the people on deck began to drive the coffin away queequeg to every one's consternation commanded that the thing should be instantly brought to him nor was there any denying him seeing that of all mortals some dying men are the most tyrannical and certainly since they will shortly trouble us so little for evermore the poor fellows ought to be indulged leaning over in his hammock queequeg long regarded the coffin with an attentive eye he then called for his harpoon and had the wooden stock drawn from it and then had the iron part placed in the coffin along with one of the paddles of his boat all by his own request also biscuits were then ranged round the sides within a flask of fresh water was placed at the head and a small bag of woody earth scraped up in the hold at the foot and a piece of sailcloth being rolled up for a pillow queequeg now entreated to be lifted into his final bed that he might make trial of its comforts if any it had he lay without moving a few minutes then told one to go to his bag and bring out his little god yojo then crossing his arms on his breast with yojo between he called for the coffin lid hatch he called it to be placed over him the head part turned over with a leather hinge and there lay queequeg in his coffin with little but his composed countenance in view rarmai it will do it is easy he murmured at last and signed to be replaced in his hammock but ere this was done pip who had been slyly hovering near by all this while drew nigh to him where he lay and with soft sobbings took him by the hand in the other holding his tambourine poor rover will ye never have done with all this weary roving where go ye now but if the currents carry ye to those sweet antilles where the beaches are only beat with water lilies will ye do one little errand for me seek out one pip who's now been missing long i think he's in those far antilles if ye find him then comfort him for he must be very sad for look he's left his tambourine behind i found it rig a dig dig now queequeg die and i'll beat your dying march i have heard 
murmured Starbuck, gazing down the scuttle, that in violent fevers men, all ignorance, have talked in ancient tongues, and that when the mystery is probed it turns out always that in their wholly forgotten childhood those ancient tongues had been really spoken in their hearing by some lofty scholars. So to my fond faith poor Pip, in this strange sweetness of his lunacy, brings heavenly vouchers of all our heavenly homes. Where learned he that but there? Hark, he speaks again, but more wildly now. Form two and two. Let's make a general of him. Ho! Oh, where's his harpoon? Lay it across here. Rig-a-dig-dig. -dig. Huzzah! Oh, for a gamecock now to sit upon his head and crow. Queequeg dies game. Mind ye that. Queequeg dies game. Take ye good heed of that. Queequeg dies game, I say. Game, game, game. But base little Pip, he died a coward. Died all a shiver. Out upon Pip. Hark ye, if ye find Pip, tell all the Antilles he's a runaway, a coward, a coward, a coward. Tell them he jumped from a whale-boat. I'd never beat my tambourine over base Pip, and hail him general, if he were once more dying here. No, no, shame upon all cowards, shame upon them. Let him go drown like Pip that jumped from a whale-boat. Shame, shame. During all this Queequeg lay with closed eyes, as if in a dream. Pip was led away, and the sick man was replaced in his hammock. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied. Soon there seemed no need of the carpenter's box, and thereupon, when some expressed their delighted surprise, he, in substance, said that the cause of his sudden convalescence was this. At a critical moment he had just recalled a little duty ashore, which he was leaving undone, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. He could not die yet, he averred. They asked him, then, whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a wail or a gale, or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. Now, there is this noteworthy difference between savage and civilized, that while a sick civilized man may be six months convalescing, generally speaking, a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. So, in good time, my Queequeg gains strength, and at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days, but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out his arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a little bit, and then, springing into the head of his hoisted boat, and poising a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness, he now used his coffin for a sea-chest, and emptying into it his canvas bag of clothes, set them in order there. Many spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving, in his rude way, to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body. And this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer on his island, who, by those hieroglyphic marks, had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth, and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth, so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume, but whose mysteries not even himself could read, though his own live heart beat against them. And these mysteries were therefore destined in the end to moulder away with the living parchment whereon they were inscribed, and so be unsolved to the last. And this thought it must have been which suggested to Ahab that wild exclamation of his, when one morning turning away from surveying poor Queequeg, Oh, devilish tantalization of the gods!